Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. You know, they always say in life, the little choices you make have ripple effects. And, and this week, Abigail made a choice to go to Henrietta and work in the store with my sister and her daughters, which meant she wasn't at church tonight, which meant Zach sat with his mother, Melody sat alone, and Cody ended up having to sit by himself. These are all the ripple effects of life. <laughs> You just never know how your decisions are going to affect people, right? I mean, it's the way it happens. Isaiah 53. We're going to look at the first three verses tonight. This is now the word of God. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this evening and again we return to this really such an important such an important truth where your entire word is inspired your entire word is important and yet there's something in us that that senses lord that when we walk in this chapter we are certainly walking in holy ground that father when we see that the atoning work of christ on the cross is explained to us in such vivid detail and such deep theological accuracy lord we we comprehend things here that we would not otherwise comprehend, and we understand that there's something very serious about our time spent in these verses. There's also something very emotional about it to us, Lord. Very, um, Lord, it, it touches our heart because these are, these are words that apply directly to our life. We're mentioned all throughout this chapter, only we're not mentioned positively. We're, we're the negative example. It's us who despised, and it's us who did not esteem and it's us who strayed like sheep and it's us who had transgression and us who had sin and us who had offended you and yet it's him who redeemed us it's him who suffered for our sin it's him who endured to save those of us who did not esteem him he loved us when we did not love him so lord there's something very captivating to us about this truth as well and something that that touches our lives and our hearts and causes us to love you and to love Christ even more. And certainly that's our prayer. We, we don't want to just learn. We, we, want to, we want to commune with you in your word. And so tonight we pray as we, we look at these three verses that, God, your spirit would speak and speak clarity of truth, but also, Lord God, speak directly to each heart that, that we might see Christ and, and see what he is to us and see what he's done for us and see where we have walked with him and walked before him. And God, we just entrust all of these things to your spirit who alone can do that work. So God, we ask you now to take your word, help us see it and be glorified through it. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. We began this mighty, what we call the suffering servant passage. As I told you this morning, this is the fourth in Isaiah's book. And it really starts in Isaiah 52, 13 and goes through Isaiah 53, 12. There's five stanzas of three verses and they all deal predominantly or overwhelmingly with what we call the suffering servant. Even though this morning we saw him as the successful servant, the one whom God promised would be exalted and is exalted and the one the people whom they don't see now will one day see and love and honor and respect, he still overall is considered the suffering servant. And I remind you again about this chapter that the importance of it, the significance of it cannot be overstated. You can't say enough good about Isaiah 53. You can't lift it too high. You can't brag about it too much. You can't read it too often. You can't share it too widely. You can't dive in it and study it and dig in it. You just can't be there too much. There's there's more there than, than eyes will ever see, but it's, it's that high and that important because it explains to us what we would not see with our eyes. We could sit at the foot of the cross and watch the Lord Jesus be nailed there. 
And we could watch the sky go dark and and we could watch him become marred and disfigured in our sight and we could watch him die and we could watch them take him off the cross and we could watch them bury him in that new tomb and we can even see him rise from the dead and still not really know what's going on. And we saw that in the Gospels, didn't we? Jesus dies, they bury him in a rich man's tomb, but three days later the women show up and what are they doing, celebrating? Are they looking for an empty tomb? No, they're weeping. And when they find the empty tomb, Mary goes up to the one she supposes to be the gardener. It's actually Jesus, and what's her question? Not, is he alive? It's, where did you move him? What did you do with him? She didn't understand what went on at the cross. She didn't even understand the significance of the empty tomb. Human reasoning and human intellect couldn't grasp that. She didn't get it. You see Peter and John then running to the tomb. Why? Because they think Jesus is alive? If you think he's alive, you don't go to the grave. They don't think he's alive. They're looking for the body. They're going to take it upon themselves and find out what happened to the body of Jesus. Where did they take him? We're looking for clues. You see any footprints? Where did the body go? They don't understand what's happened. We see those two men on the road to Emmaus. They actually are visiting with Jesus, although they don't recognize him. And they look at Jesus and say, we were hoping it was him who was going to redeem Israel. But all that's happened in the last few days, it's over, right? Even when Jesus appeared to the twelve, it says in the end of Matthew's gospel that they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Remember Thomas, right? I'm not going to believe unless I stick my finger in the holes in his hands and my hand in his side. And the point is, these were men who walked with Jesus, lived with Jesus, saw his miracles, heard his preaching, and even they, just by watching the crucifixion and seeing the empty tomb, still of their own human reasoning and logic did not understand what went on there. Because you couldn't. It is too high. It is too lofty. It is too magnificent. Only when Christ opened their minds to understand the scriptures, only when by the the work of the Holy Spirit could they come back and read Isaiah 53 and the light bulb comes on and now they see him. And they understand the cross and they understand what went on there and they understand the beating he took and they understand why he was buried in a rich man's tomb and they understand why he was raised from the dead and they understand why he is highly exalted. This chapter is where we learn that the suffering of Christ was for our sin. This chapter is where we learn that the suffering of Christ fully satisfied the wrath of God. This chapter is where we learn that he made propitiation for us. This chapter is where we learn that justification is awarded to sinners based on his work. All of those verses you read in the New Testament that explain to us the atoning work of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus all find their origin right here. This is a huge chapter. We began it this morning actually up in chapter 52 which is part of this segment where we talked about the successful servant. That God announced that he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted and you should read that he will be raised from the dead and ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of the father because that's exactly what happened even though he was the one that was crushed beyond human recognition even though he was the one whom God poured his wrath out upon like he had never poured his wrath on any man even Nadab and Abihu who offered strange fire didn't suffer like Christ even Uzzah who had the audacity to reach out and touch the ark did not suffer like Christ even Saul who had blasphemed God through his failure to obey and worship God even Uzziah who boldly and arrogantly entered the temple where he had no right to be even those who had sinned against God in grave fashion in arrogant fashion did not suffer like Christ suffered and so he became the most unlikely candidate for the exaltation of God and yet that's exactly what he was he was a Paul he was appearance was marred more than any man and yet God exalted him and what we found out this morning is that through death he atoned for many even Gentiles and so his suffering did not become a hindrance to his exaltation we found out that his suffering was the means of his exaltation his suffering is what God used to exalt him it didn't stop his exaltation it solidified it and that's what we call in the successful servant well tonight we want to move forward and tonight we want to talk now about his rejection tonight we're going to talk about the scorned servant we talk about the rejection of christ and this has really been the primary focus of isaiah even since chapter 50 you remember why was there no man when i came even though he came 
Even though he was God's Messiah, he was clearly rejected by Israel. And tonight, again, we see why. So let's work our way through three, these three verses. Again, three points. Number one, the question. Verse one, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, if you'll think about it, this has really been the question of Isaiah's entire ministry. Who has received the revelation of the Christ? That's really been the whole point of his ministry. If you go back to Isaiah 6, the day that Isaiah was saved, the day that he was commissioned before the Lord, you remember the whole story, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and his hypocrisy was exposed, but God took the live coal and atoned for his sin. That coal was Christ, by the way, and atoned for his sin, and Isaiah was forgiven, and Isaiah was saved, and he then heard the voice of the Lord, who shall go for us? And Isaiah gives that famous, here am I, send me. And there we found out the specific commission of Isaiah's ministry. Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, he said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. And what we found out that day and what Isaiah learned is that his ministry would be primarily one of revealed condemnation. It was going to be the ministry of Isaiah. Isaiah's real success, if you want to call it success, would be in exposing the blindness of his people. It would be a hard ministry. It would be an out-of-season ministry. The more he would preach, the more we would come to see that the people did not understand. He was proving the fulfillment of this question throughout his ministry. When Jesus shows up, the ministry of Jesus is the exact same thing. In fact, I've told you, no one particular verse from the Old Testament is quoted more in the New Testament than Isaiah 6-9. That was quoted more than any other. And so not only was Isaiah giving us a prophetic truth about Christ, Isaiah's ministry is a prophetic picture of Christ's ministry. It's a picture of it. Isaiah shines the light which exposes the blindness. Jesus is the light which exposes the blindness. And so it's a very fitting question. Here in Isaiah 53, it's really been the heart of his ministry Who has believed our message? It's almost like he's going to take inventory now. I've been preaching for years, and I want to know, raise your hand, the evangelist would say, if you have believed in Christ. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Those are the questions. Now, the answer might shock you. Jesus quoted that very verse, or John actually quoted that verse about Jesus, John 12. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? John said, even though he'd worked all these miracles, they didn't believe. Paul uses this verse to speak about the stubbornness of Israel in Romans ten sixteen. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? But here... In Isaiah 53, 1, we actually get a little more insight as to why they did not believe. And the second question is the one that gives us that insight because Isaiah says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And here we learn that in part, the failure to believe the truth stems from a refusal of God to reveal the truth to them. He he doesn't say, And to whom has believed, he says, to whom has it been revealed? And the implication here is that it has not been revealed to everyone. And that seems strange to us. I know people people balk at this notion that God might not have revealed it to everyone. We we have our cries of that's not fair and that shouldn't happen. and, And God reveals it to everyone. Let's take a moment again and understand for a second the revelation of God. You need to understand how the revelation of God works. You need to understand it in general for ministry. You need to understand it in your life. Uh, We understand human limitation, first of all. If you don't, you need to get that. And that is that no human can of his own logical human intuition discern the truth of God. You don't have that kind of intellectual capacity. You don't have that kind of ability. You dwell in time, in space, in America, Texas, Spur, right? That's where you're at. God dwells outside of this. If God doesn't reveal it, you never see it. You're you're not going to get it. 
It says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. i got a cat that lives on my front porch that does not understand why I wear pants. Cannot figure it out. She looks at me every time I walk out, and I know that's what she's thinking. What's the deal with the pants, right? I'm beyond her in every possible way, and that's just me and a cat. God is beyond. We can't see. And so if God doesn't reveal, we won't see it. And the question here is, who has God revealed it to? And and we would want to say, well, surely he's revealed it to everyone. No, you need to understand the revelation of God. We have what we call general revelation. You're familiar with this. The youth have studied it in Romans, in Romans chapter 1. And general revelation, we commonly talk about as being what, you youth? Well, there's only a couple of you here. So what is general revelation? Creation is an aspect of general revelation. Remember, David said this in Psalm 8, when I consider the heavens above, the stars that you made, the finger work of God, I think, what is man that you are mindful of him, right? And so David learned a great deal about the glory and greatness and even mercy of God towards humanity simply by looking at the vastness of creation, right? That's general revelation. You, Paul says in Romans 1 that the invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen through what has been made. That's revelation of God. There's another aspect of general revelation. There you go, the conscience. Um, it's what God put in you to instinctively and intuitively know that, that murder is wrong or stealing is wrong. You, you're born knowing that. It doesn't mean you don't do it. You just Something inside of you causes you to feel guilt. That's all general revelation. Now, based on general revelation, which every man receives, every single human being is a recipient of the general revelation of God. You were born, all of us with a conscience, you were born, all of us, in creation. And so to say that God has not revealed himself to all people is not true. He has. He has generally revealed himself to every creature. And the, the emphasis is that based on what God has revealed, the creature becomes responsible then to seek the God of that revelation. Listen to Paul in Acts 17. That they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. And so the call is that based on the general revelation of God, you have seen enough that you ought to seek who's behind it. You ought to seek the author of it. You ought to seek why this conviction has come upon your heart. And we've also been taught that seeking is 100% effective. Listen to Matthew 7, 8. Jesus says, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks, what? Finds. The hymn and ox. It will be open. And that's the plan. God generally reveals himself to all men. And man is supposed to receive that general revelation and seek the God behind it. And if they do, God will reveal himself further. And if they do not, God may not reveal himself further. And that, by the way, is literally stated by Jesus. In that parable of the soils in Matthew 13, Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted, that's the disciples, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. I am not revealing it to them, he said. And you say, why? For whoever has, that would be the one who has done the right thing with the general revelation, to him more shall be given, and he'll have an abundance. But whoever does not have, that is to say the one who ignores general revelation, even what he has shall be taken away from him. That is to say even the little parts he has understood will be taken from his mind. And so clearly you have people who do not learn from general general revelation. You have people who do not seek the truth before them, and God in his sovereign prerogative may choose not to give them any more truth. And that would be an example of the people in Isaiah's day. They reject the light, and so no more light is given. But you also need to understand that general revelation is more than just creation, and it's more than just your conscience. In the days in which Jesus walked upon the earth, what else would have been considered general revelation? Think about his miraculous works. Did he do those for all to see, or did he just do it for a select handful? All saw them, didn't they? I mean, maybe not every single miracle did all see, but the feeding of the 5,000, raising Lazarus from the dead, casting the demon out of the Gadarene demoniac, right? I mean, these were 
massively public miracles. They fall under the heading of general revelation, where Jesus does something remarkable, obviously divine, and you are to see what he's done and respond and say, I don't think that's a normal guy. I think there's more to him than that. And those who then sought him as a result of his general revelation, he reveals more. Those who blow it off, ignore it, attribute it to the work of demons or Satan, perhaps they don't ever see any more. And these are the type of people we're going to deal with in Isaiah 53. But even before we get there, I, I want to make sure you understand the flip side of this. Because I don't want you to sit here and go, well, that's right. The reason I was granted knowledge of the truth, the reason I was able to see the truth about the cross, the atonement, the gospel, what the reason I got special revelation is because I, unlike them, did seek God. They looked at the stars and attributed it to horoscopes. They looked at the miracles of Jesus and attributed it to demons. But I looked at the stars and saw the glory of God. I saw the miracles of Jesus and saw it as the great deity of Jesus. They were pretty ignorant. I was discerning. They didn't respond. I did respond. They didn't seek. I did seek. And because I sought, God revealed to me, and I do not want you to pat yourself on the back like that because you got one verse you can't get around. And that verse is Romans 3.11, which says, There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. No, you didn't. The reality is, even you who do now know the truth did not come to a knowledge of that truth because you saw it while others didn't. You came to a knowledge of the truth because God, in His grace, chose to reveal that truth to you in spite of your lack of seeking. He did for you what you did not deserve. And again, this is where people cry out, that's not fair. God should have done that for everybody. But I remind you again that fair means no one ever gets special revelation. That's fair. That's fair. God has given enough of himself through creation, conscience, the incarnation of Christ that man should have seen. They didn't, and God would be justified in condemning all of humanity, but grace, God determined to go ahead and reveal himself even to some who did not deserve it all men have been shown creation no man responded to that revelation all men according to justice could have probably been judged but God chose to have grace on some and reveal himself anyway Matthew 16 is an example of this now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi he was asking his disciples who do people say that the son of man is they've seen the general revelation of the work of Christ and Jesus wants to know are they figuring it out and the answer is well some think you're John the Baptist some think you're Elijah and some think you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets and by the way what all of those have in common is they were all considered to be forerunners to the Christ but none of them considered to be the Christ and none of them certainly considered to be the son of God and what we learn is that when Jesus Jesus stuck the feeler out and asked the basic question of Isaiah 53 1 who has believed our message the disciples said nobody nobody thinks you're the son of God nobody thinks you're the Messiah and then he said to them but who do you say that I am and Simon Peter answered you're the Christ the son of the living God and Jesus said to him, not smart are you, Simon, not discerning are you, Simon, not seeking are you, Simon, but blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus didn't praise Peter for seeking while others rejected. He told Peter that he was a recipient of the blessing and the grace of God, that God had graciously chosen to reveal to him what he did not deserve to see. And I just want to make sure you understand how that works. But here in Isaiah 53, we are talking about those who received general revelation of God. They saw the miraculous signs of Christ. And Isaiah is asking of all of those people, who has believed? And what's the answer? No one. No one. And that's true. No one of their own prerogative believed unless God opened their eyes. No human of his own constitution looked at the life of Christ, even his miracles, and just believed unless God opened his eyes. But our question is, why? I mean, we think about now the works of Christ. Here's a guy who turned water into wine, 
He raised at least at the top of my account, what, four people from the dead that, that are specifically mentioned in Scripture. Cleansing lepers, healing paralytics, stopping the flow of blood in that woman, the centurion slave, walking on water. I don't even know how many demons he cast out. There was a whole legion in one guy. Um, he himself was raised from the dead. He fed the 5,000. They got the man with the withered hand. I mean, just miraculous, miraculous things. Enough evidence, certainly, to convince even the most heavy skeptic. And yet, nobody believed. And we want to know why. So you see the question. Now let's look at the problem. Here's the problem, verse 2. Why did no man believe? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. It's very poetic language here, but it becomes clear to us what the problem is. First, he says he grew up before him like a tender shoot. And what we're talking here is about how Christ lived before God. How Christ uh, grew up in the presence of God. How he orchestrated his life with the understanding that God was watching how he lived. And he's described in that role as a tender shoot. That Hebrew word is only used there in the entire Old Testament. But it speaks of a delicate plant. And even one that is still totally dependent upon the host plant. It's like a little sprout maybe that shot up off a root. If you go down to the Little League baseball field and you go to you mow down there, you'll see periodically these little cottonwood sprouts that are just shooting off of the roots that are in those cottonwood trees. And it's just a, a tender little shoot. You can mow right over it. I mean, it, it doesn't have any power on its own. And this is how Jesus is described. But what that means is that Jesus on this earth lived before God as one who did not seek to demonstrate the twisted expressions of human strength. Instead, he walked in total submission to his Father and in dependence on him. And when you want to talk about the types of words we use to describe the way that Jesus lived, we use words like meek, gentle, humble, kind, compassionate. He was the very epitome of the one who turns the other cheek. He was the very epitome of the one who goes the extra mile. 1 Peter 2 says, While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And none of those attributes look like strength to a fallen world. In reality, they are the greatest strength, and that's how Jesus lived, but they don't look like strength to people. And you know this. Think about our own political climate. What happens now when they're going to show you some news clip and it's going to take you to the floor of Congress and either going to have one of those tribunal trials that they do periodically and you're going to have some congressman or congresswoman interviewing someone here about some mistake or scandal or whatever it may be and, and nothing's ever resolved at any of those. You know that. We don't ever see any results out of any of them. But what is the demeanor, always the demeanor of that congressperson that's asking the questions? Oh, yeah, they're very tacky, and they're very bullyish, and they, you know, they talk real braggadocious and how they're so big and they're so... Why? Because they're trying to get reelected, and that looks strength. And so when their constituents uh, you know, chime in to watch this, they're like, boy, my congressman got after him today. He was tough. He went and took the bull by the horns. Well, why do you think there's such a faction? I know to some it's irritating, but why do you think there's such a faction even that loves Donald Trump? Because to so many, that's the epitome of strength, right? That professional wrestler attitude that I'm going to get up and I'll kick your tail and I'll I'll what it, and that looks like strength to people right doesn't it that's what our world thinks that's strong and I want somebody strong I want somebody that's tough I want somebody that's powerful and here's the problem with Jesus that's not how he looked was he strong oh yeah strength under control that's meekness but he wasn't a bully Remember Isaiah 42, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. He'll bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. He's not going to go to the debate floor and mock or threaten someone. He wasn't going to yell or use divine power to knock you to the ground. And let's be honest, that's what they wanted. We wanted Jesus to walk in here in a muscle shirt, right? 
and flex his muscle and put his enemies on the ground. We want him to point his finger at Herod and say, I'll meet you right out here in the middle of the Colosseum and you and I will settle this right now. That's what they wanted. They wanted somebody that put Pilate on his face. That's what they were looking for. And that's not what he came to do. He was a tender shoot. We also read in verse 2 that he was like a root out of parched ground. What does that mean? It speaks of his pedigree. That speaks of where he came from. Today, we like to honor people sometimes if they come from the right family. Uh, I know from my high school days and early adulthood, the Bush family seemed to really have a sort of a monopoly on politics, right? You had the dad and then the son, then there was the governor out in Florida. And I mean, there was all this sort of Bush monopoly. We still hear about the Kennedys even to this day, right? There's sort of a pedigree that runs. And so if you were a Bush or you were a Kennedy or you had the right name, that you automatically seem to have sort of an easy access into politics. Or we think about professional sports and we watch some great athletes athlete and then we watched that athlete's son you know there was a big stir what in the nba because what's the guy's name i came to i don't even watch the nba the big guy anyway that's supposed to be lebron james son just got drafted to play right with him and it's like how good will he be i don't know but he's got the last name james so he's got to be great right right now you can go look up the backup quarterback of the university of texas who has only ever played in two games but he has already amassed 3.2 million dollars of nil money do you know why because he's so good no but because his last name is manning and so he fits the bill right and we understand then pedigree matters who your family is it matters your bloodline it matters your genetics it matters where you come from and the problem with jesus was by the world's estimation he didn't have much benefit there he came out of parched ground yeah matthew reveals that joseph was of the kingly line but at the time matthew wrote that that kingly line hadn't been recognized in quite some time Instead, men saw the pedigree of Jesus as very ordinary. Listen to Matthew 13. He came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? And if you don't know it, that's a term of derision. Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet's not without honor except in his own hometown and his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. What was their problem? That he didn't have power? No, he had power. That he didn't have wisdom? No, he had wisdom. The problem was they wanted to know, Who is this guy? Why should we listen to him? The carpenter's son? You're going to take advice from a carpenter's son, right? I mean, y'all got it worse than that. Y'all are listening to a horse trader's son. He just wasn't Messiah material. He didn't come from the right bloodline. So we have a meek and mild man from an ordinary family. He's not the first pick of the people. We go beyond that. And it says he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. We learned this morning that form was a reference to his body and appearance was a reference to his face. And so when you look him over, he just doesn't look kingly. He just... He doesn't enter a room the right way. Years ago, coaching Little League, I had a team that was pretty good. And one of the players on the team, he was an okay player, but he wasn't my best player by far. Um, Stats prove that out. You can prove everything baseball in stats. He wasn't my best pitcher. He wasn't my best fielder. He wasn't my best hitter. In fact, he was kind of afraid of the ball. But every time we went to play anywhere, the other team always thought that kid's the best player right there. And you know why? Because he had all the paraphernalia that you could possibly own to wear as a baseball player, and he had the right kind of strut when he walked onto the field. He just looked the part. Was he the part? Not really. No little leaguer is, by the way. But he looked the part. He he had the right gait. He, you know, he carried his head the right way. He wore his cap cocked just the right way. You know, he, he had the right stand. He'd watched enough YouTube videos to know what a baseball player was supposed to look like anyway. And so he looked kingly. Jesus didn't. They wanted Saul, who stood head and shoulders above all the people. Where's that guy? They wanted David, who'd slain his ten thousands. Where's that guy? Uh, They wanted the guy that looked like Gladiator, you know, or Schwarzenegger or whatever, that he's going to come in and nobody's going to mess with him. He's just this, his very countenance evoke strength he's the kind of guy that when you you walked into a debate room if this guy stood up to talk to you you would immediately bow down not because he was so smart but because of the intimidation of his presence 
And Jesus didn't do that to you. Jesus didn't intimidate you by his presence. He didn't, he didn't come up to you and just wow you and captivate you by his physique. He, he didn't have that kingly aura where you're like, if we go to battle, that's the guy I'm taking. That wasn't the thought. He had no majesty about him. Now, by the way, some balk a little here. The Jews, I told you this passage, they think it's about them. They say it can't be about Jesus because they say Jesus did attract crowds at times. I mean, they read about him feeding the 5,000, feeding the 4,000. They read in John 6 about how they were going to take him by force and make him king. They talk about his triumphal entry and how the people are laying down their coats and crying Hosanna. And their argument is, obviously, they were attracted to him. Obviously, they did look upon him. So it couldn't be about Jesus. But Isaiah is not referring to the momentary infatuation of the crowd. Isaiah is referring to the lasting devotion of the crowd. And it's true. Hungry crowds were very enamored with him when he fed them. And in John 6, when he fed the 5,000, there was a discussion about making him king. But by the end of John 6, when he said he came from heaven, they were out of there. And it's true that in John chapter 7, people saw his miracles and heard his words and wondered if his claim to be the Messiah might be true, and they even claimed to believe in him. But in John chapter 8, when Jesus told them they were slaves of sin, they tried to stone him to death. And yes, a large multitude of people did welcome him at the triumphal entry, but four days later, the people that yelled Hosanna began to yell crucify. For brief moments, Jesus did look like the guy they wanted, but when they learned why he came, they were totally unenthused. He did not come in majesty. He came in humiliation, and no one wanted a king like that. And the overwhelming testimony of the Gospels is that not only did they reject him as king, they mocked him for even insinuating that he might be a king. Listen to the mocking. In Matthew 26, 67, they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Matthew 27, 29, after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. And Matthew 27, 35, when they'd crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots and sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Matthew 27, 39, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you're going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I'm the Son of God. And the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. You see the disdain. He has no stately form or majesty. No appearance that we should be attracted to him. He just didn't look kingly. While there were moments where the selfish crowd was hopeful that he might grant their carnal desires, the reality is that the more he showed them who he was, the less of him they wanted. Ultimately, they tried to throw him off a cliff. They tried to stone him. They tried to arrest him, tried to kill him, tried to discredit him, tried to trap him, and they ended up crucifying him. He just didn't fit the bill of what they were looking for in a king. And when we go back to the question of verse 1, who has believed our message, now we find out why they didn't. He wasn't what they wanted. Had they known sin was their biggest problem, he would have fit the bill precisely. But because they thought Rome was their problem, they wanted no part of this Jesus who was meek and mild and timid. They were not timid, but meek and mild and gracious and kind. In fact, apart from the gracious revelation of God, no one believed him. No one wanted him. And then we come to that third point, which is the response. Here's how they responded to this king. Verse 3. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. They should have crowned him king. They should have bowed to him in reverence and awe. They should have taken up their cross and followed him. But what did they do? Isaiah says he was despised 
and forsaken of men. And I want you to take special note of the word despised because that seems to be the main point of Isaiah because he circles back to it in the last line of verse 3 when he says again, he was despised and we did not esteem him. That word despised in the Hebrew is bazaar. And it means to despise or to hold with contempt. It actually comes from a root word which means to trample underfoot. It's the same word that was used about Esau in Genesis twenty five thirty four, when Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He didn't want it. He didn't think he needed it. He despised it. He trampled it underfoot. And so the first thing we see regarding the people's estimation of Christ is that he was trampled. He was despised and forsaken of men. He was not valued. He was turned away. He was not wanted. He was given up. He was considered as having no value. Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And in the Old Testament, 30 pieces of silver was the price of money you owned if your bull got out and gored your neighbor's slave to death. 30 pieces of silver was the redemption price of a gored slave. And that was the value of Jesus. The people traded him even for a murderer named Barabbas. That was the value of Jesus. They despised him. They did not steam him. They forsook him. We also find out not only was he trampled, but he was troubled. It says he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Sorrows there can be literal physical pain. It can also be overwhelming sorrow. In our Lord, we see both. You only have to see him on trial, being beaten, mocked, the crown of thorns, punched in the face, plucked out his beard, hit in the head with a reed, scorned with that cat of nine tails, nailed to a cross, physical pain fits. But you want to talk about sorrow, we see him in the garden where he's sweating drops of blood, hanging on the cross, crying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This Jesus was with both. Not only was this man totally despised by the people, but he was terribly afflicted by them. Mankind did the worst to Christ they could imagine. A corrupt trial, a humiliating death, a painful death. They hung him naked between two criminals and mocked him while he hung there. It doesn't get any lower than that. He was trampled, he was troubled, he was turned away. You read in that third line, like one from whom men hide their face. We wouldn't acknowledge him. They wouldn't help him. His disciples fled from him in the garden. Those who had seen his miracles attributed him to Satan. Those who heard him preach distorted his words and misquoted him. No one came to his defense. No one came to his aid. Everyone turned their back. Isaiah adds the exclamation mark at the end to repeat it again, saying he was despised. Isaiah says, do you get it? He was despised. They didn't reluctantly hand him over. Uh, They didn't feel bad about it. Or maybe you're in a predicament where somebody's got to die and you all, you know, cast lots or pull straws and you feel bad because that person has to go and and suffer for everybody else and and you feel bad about it and you applaud them while they go and you're like, thank you for, for, for taking my place. Thank you for standing in the gap. And nobody felt that way about him. Isaiah says, despised. We hated him. They trampled him underfoot. They wanted nothing to do with him. He had no value to us whatsoever. And then Isaiah makes the statement, and we did not esteem him. That word esteem, you've seen it before. In fact, it's a very important word to you. It's the Hebrew word hashav. And you've seen it in Genesis 15, 6. Then he believed in the Lord, and he hashav it to him as righteousness reckoned that very word which is the heart of our gospel which speaks of the imputation of righteousness the reckoning of right that's the same word you know it is reckoned or imputed the word here is translated esteemed later in isaiah 53 4 we'll read yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken smitten of god and afflicted in other words When we saw Christ in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his sorrow, being rejected by men, we did not applaud him, we did not esteem him, we did not reckon him as a savior, we did not credit him as a king, we did not reckon glory to him, we did not reckon honor to him, we did not reckon kingship to him, we imputed to him worthlessness. Like Esau thought of his birthright, 
That's what we thought about him. When mankind measured Jesus, they did not honor him as God. They did not marvel at his power. They judged him to be of no value, no worth, and they tossed him aside as a criminal to be executed. Matthew 26, 64, Jesus said to them, you said it yourself, nevertheless I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he's blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you've now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered, <coughs> he deserves death. That's what man reckoned to Christ. That's what we imputed to him. That was the value we assessed for him. Judas at least thought he was worth 30 pieces of silver. He was trampled, troubled, turned away, and tossed aside. He was sent outside the city where he would be executed like a criminal. He was rejected, not honored. He was not reckoned to be the Messiah. He was considered to be a fraud, and they murdered him. Matthew 27, 17, it says, So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that because of envy they'd handed him over. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. And the governor said to him, Which of you two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with you? Excuse me, with Jesus, who's called Christ. And they all said, crucify him. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, crucify him. He was the scorned servant. All because he did not look like the king they wanted. They wanted a king to feed them. They wanted a king to fight for them. They wanted a mighty man to lead them to prominence. He came to save them from sin not Rome. He demonstrated godliness in everything he did. He offered sinners reconciliation with God and man wanted neither. We don't want godliness and we don't want reconciliation with God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. As Isaiah has repeatedly shown us, they wanted the wrong salvation. And so he was scorned. That really poses, first of all, I think a dilemma to some of us believers. I heard a preacher once say, how is it that the world couldn't get on with the holiest man who ever lived, but they can get on with you and me? Are we compromised? Is there no righteousness that reflects upon their corruption? That's a pretty convicting reality. They didn't like him, but somehow they like us. But beyond that, the real question of the text the real question of Isaiah 53, 1 to 3 is the same question Jesus asked his disciples. Going back to it again in Matthew 16, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? There it is. What do you do with him? We know what his contemporaries did. They did not esteem him. They didn't want the salvation he offered. They wanted to keep their sin. They wanted freedom from Rome, but they didn't want freedom from their own flesh. And since Jesus didn't come to do that, they rejected him. He wasn't the king they wanted, so they despised him. They figuratively trampled him underfoot. What about you? The writer of Hebrews no doubt picked up on Isaiah's statement because notice what he says in Hebrews 10, 29. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Who do you say that he is? Have you esteemed him? Or how do you esteem him? Do you reckon him a nuisance? Do you reckon him a troublemaker? Do you reckon him a problem? Do you reckon him a bad king, a worthless king, a useless deliverer? Or do you reckon him as everything? 
Do you reckon him as the all-glorious Savior of the world? Do you reckon him as the all-sufficient one? Do you reckon him as the treasure of the field, the pearl of great value, the one thing you can't live without? All I want, we sing, all I need is you. How do you reckon Christ? Do you honor him? Do you see him as the Savior you need? Have you confessed him? Are you following him? He is the scorned servant. That's true in our world. But don't let him be the scorned servant in your life. Has God chosen to reveal to you that he is more than a failed king? That he is more than a failed, you know, uh, revolutionary? That he is, in fact, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and he is, in fact, highly exalted? Has God shown you that? Then believe in him. Follow him. Trust him. Go against the grain of the world. They may scorn him, but you should love him. But this is why men reject. They reject Christ when they love their sin. They reject Christ when he doesn't come to save them from what they want to be saved from. Don't do that. Honor him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you because you're a God, and we thank you, Lord, for the glory of Christ. We read these verses, and it does fill our hearts with sorrow and sadness that Christ would have to endure such pain and sorrow and grief. He didn't deserve it. We do, but he took it. Lord God, we thank you that he did, and we thank you that he endured, and he bore it to the end. But we pray, God, that your revelation would now pour into the hearts of all of those who hear tonight. Lord, we know that on our own we would never believe, but if you, by your grace, would open our hearts, if you, by your grace, would open our eyes, if you, by your grace, would open our ears, and you would reveal the truth of Christ to us, that we would confess you, and that's what we ask, God. I ask that for those in here who've never trusted you, who've never confessed you, that you would open their eyes, that you would reveal this truth, that you'd go beyond just the general revelation of your creation or their conscience or even the miracles they read about, but that you would reveal to them that Jesus is the Christ, that he would be, re- that he would be real in their hearts and real in their lives, and that tonight they would confess him and trust him and call upon him, that they would stop scorning him, that they would start reckoning him as nothing and would start reckoning him as everything that they would trade everything for him. For what does it it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? But that they would sell everything that they might gain that treasure. They'd sell everything that they might gain that pearl. They'd leave everything that they might follow you. Lord, where would we go? You have words of eternal life. Lord, we pray that you would open eyes and ears and hearts to all who hear that they might have that truth revealed and might love Christ and stop scorning him. God, do your work, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.